everyone, and thank you so much for being here for the launch of the Women's Health Hub. The Hub is a very exciting, growing repository of evidence-based resources which focus on women's health, which is obviously so needed. Um, my name is Kate Robinson, and today I'm going to be guiding you along today's proceedings. For accessibility, I'll just start by doing a brief visual description of myself. So I am an Iranian Australian woman with brown hair and a colorful shirt and uh, earrings, and I have a blurred background. Today, I'm actually not dialing in from Aboriginal land, but usually I live and work on the unceded sovereign lands of the Bunurong and Wurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. And I know that many of you are tuning in from all over the country today. And so I just really wanna to start today by encouraging you to take a moment to think about whose land you live, work, walk on, that your feet are on right now and really acknowledge those traditional custodians, those elders, past, present, and those yet to come. And think about the fact that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. It's really, really important that today in this discussion about women's health, we really centre and keep First Nations perspective um, in focus for all of our discussions. Now, as you know, we're here to celebrate the launch of the new Women's Health Hub. The Hub has grown out of the need for a single entry point at the national level to access and share information on women's health. And the Hub is actually going to include um, a copy of today's Zoom recording. Um, so after the session, you'll be able to catch up and rewatch all of the great moments. Um, it's also going to include something that I'm personally very excited about, which is a graphic recording of today's event. We're really, really lucky to have Josephine Ford um, helping us today to make a piece of art which really reflects the conversations and breadth of discussion that we're having. And at the end of the session, don't worry, you're going to be able to have a look at what she's come up with. Um, and that too will be on the hub. Uh, just a few pieces of housekeeping to kick off. Um, just so you know, uh, today the video and audio is off for anyone um, except our speakers. Uh, we do have a Q&A function. Um, that Q&A function is really um, to spark um, some conversation between our panel members. Um, and so if you do have any questions, um, feel free to put that um, in the Q&A. And then when we get an opportunity to have that discussion a bit later on today, um, we'll hopefully be able to come back to some of those. Closed captions are also available um, on the Zoom. And of course, you'll be able to see that um, we have the support of some incredible Auslan interpreters today. Um, so I'd like to introduce you uh, to Jerry, uh, who's on the screen with me right now. And later, you'll also um, be seeing um, Fiona. And finally, um, for those that are on social media having a discussion while we're a discussion online while we're having this Zoom, um, please use the hashtag Women's Health Hub. Uh, yeah, we'd love to hear what you think. And so today, to kick off our formal proceedings. Um, we're now going to hear from Bonnie Corbin. Bonnie is the chair of the Australian Women's Health Alliance. So I'll throw over to you, Bonnie. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kate. So starting with a visual description, I'm a white woman with light brown hair and a purple jacket. Behind me is an office with plants and some photos of women on the wall. I acknowledge that I'm joining from Wurundjeri country, part of the Kulin Nation. My respect to elders past and present and to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Welcome to the Assistant Minister for, the, for Health and Aged Care, the Honourable Deb Carney, 
and to the South Australian Minister for Women and the Prevention of Domestic and Family Violence, Katrine Hildyard, MP, attending on behalf of Premier Peter Malinowskis. Welcome to all of our members and supporters joining us today. This truly is a historic moment for women's health. Today, we celebrate 40 years of women's health policy with a refreshed platform for change. Globally, we're witnessing a backlash against gender equity and human rights. It's critical that platforms such as the Women's Health Hub exist and persist as they provide a rich source of wisdom and resources that we need to fight back with policy. Information is power. This central bank of women's health resources informed by ongoing evidence and living expertise will help us to continue to reshape conversations towards gender and health equity for all. Given the breadth and depth of this redesign work, we also took the opportunity to refresh our visual identity and organisational name. Subsequently, we've evolved from the Australian Women's Health Network to the Australian Women's Health Alliance. Our refreshed brand identity reflects our role as a contemporary organisation that's evidence-based, inclusive, and collaborative. Within our organisational identity, we weave the same ethos and values from when we were established in 1986. We are individuals who are part of communities, organisations, and groups who are all incredibly passionate about health policy, gender equity, and social models of health. The knowledge we share on this hub will grow to reflect decades of women's movements for change. I'd like to recognise four women who shared both historical and recent contributions. They are Gwendolyn Gray Jameson, Marilyn Beaumont, Professor Helen Kelleher, and Kelly Bannister. Thank you. Gratitude to our subcommittee chairs who have led us through a chapter of reflection and renewal, Dr. Angela Brown, Holly Brennan, Gemma Black, Dr. Romy Listo, and Joe Flanagan. A very special thanks to Danielle Crozier, and her colleagues at Women's Health New South Wales, who are an essential part of our administrative function, existence and persistence. This first release of the hub is just the beginning. How it evolves from here is up to all of us, our members, our collaborators and beyond. And with that, I would like to now hand over to the Assistant Minister for Health and Aged Care, the Honourable Jed Carney. Thank you, Assistant Minister. Uh, I am really, really thrilled to be here with you today. I did notice that um, uh, people were giving a visual description of themselves. I am a 60-year-old, nearly 60-year-old white woman with graying brown hair, bespectacled, and uh, I am in my office on Warrenjeri land. And behind me is a wonderful picture of one of my heroes of the labour movement, Gough Whitlam. And Gough is surrounded by... Um, a, a, uh, a border that says he supports an Aboriginal voice to Parliament. Now, I don't know that for sure because Gough is, of course, passed away, but I am pretty, pretty positive that were he here, he would be a great supporter. And so um, having acknowledged that I am on Warrenjeri land, I pay my respects to elders past and present, and I extend that respect to First Nations people joining us today. If ever we did need a reason that we, for having a Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to parliament, I think it's in the area of health. Uh, the gaps are still too wide. We know uh, maternity statistics uh, are certainly concerning. Um, all of the health gaps um, are a concern for Australians more broadly, but of course, for the Australian parliament and having a voice will certainly go a long way to getting advice from First Nations people about how we close those gaps. So I'd like everybody to reflect deeply on um, how they will vote at the upcoming referendum. But today I'm excited to be here to launch the Australian Women's Health Alliance um, Health Hub, Women's Health Hub. So many women's in there. Let me say that again. I'm sorry, everybody. The Australian Women's Health Alliance Women's Health Hub. 
It's very, very exciting. I want to commend the Alliance for its national advocacy on women's health. Um, the work you do is incredibly invaluable, uh, not only to me as an assistant health minister um, and to our uh, Minister for Women, but to all governments, all policymakers, and all healthcare givers right across the country. Um, having said that, I would like to acknowledge Minister Hildegard, uh, my fellow Labor um, uh, comrade from the South Australian Parliament. It's lovely to have you here, Katrine, and I look forward to catching up soon. A woman-centred analysis of all models of health, medical care and research underpins the Australian Women's Health Alliance in advocating for women's health as a key issue. The new Women's Health Hub will make an important and necessary difference. The hub, as you probably know, is an online portal for organisations to locate and add information on Australians' women's health and health policy. Crucially, the new hub has been informed by lived experience. You've done an amazing job to refresh this hub in consultation with key collaborators, including Health Peak and professional organisations, health consumers, gender equity organisations, and health, social, and community services. The aim is to increase evidence based knowledge about effective prevention from a gender equity lens as well as strengthen national advocacy and help members drive collective advocacy at local, regional, state and national levels. Many of you may know that gender equity and improving health outcomes for women is an absolute passion of mine. The Australian government's latest funding to the Australian Women's Health Alliance, some $490,000 over three years, includes funding for the Women's Health Hub refresh. I said earlier that I was proud to be part of a government that's giving a voice to First Nations people. But I'm also very proud to be part of a government that is profoundly committed to supporting, protecting and promoting the health and well-being of all women and girls. It's a key priority for the Albanese government and something, as I said, I am very passionate about. Australian women, girls, and those who are part of diverse communities like LGBTIQ people, especially those at greater risk of poor health, deserve equal access to safe, effective, affordable, and appropriate healthcare services and support that is tailored to their circumstances. The government is committed to progressing better health outcomes for women and girls, including work to consider the impact of gender bias in the health system. Our recent budget includes measures to support equitable healthcare access for women, something I'm pretty proud of, as our commitment to strengthen Medicare for all Australians. These include Medicare rebates for longer GP consultations to support improved access and affordability for patients with chronic conditions and complex needs, such as those that might be related to family, domestic and sexual violence, as well as reproductive health matters, including menopause. As well, our historic increase in incentives for bulk billing will support women on low incomes and their children. The government is also considering the recommendations of the recently tabled report of the Senate inquiry into universal access to reproductive health care, and we are working through our response right now. I thank all of you who've contributed your insights to inform the, refined, the, inform the findings of the report. As part of the National Women's Health Advisory Council, of which I'm pleased to say, Australian Women's Health Alliance's executive chair, the fabulous Miss Bonnie Corbin, is a council member. And we are undertaking a national consultation survey. This was launched just Friday. The survey's aim is to better understand the issues Australian women, girls, gender diverse people face in healthcare. The survey is available in multiple languages and is open for three months. So women all around the country can provide information about their experiences of gender bias in the healthcare system. I really encourage all of you to let your networks know about the survey and encourage women to upload their stories. There is a lengthy survey that can fill in the survey if they wish. Um, there's the ability to just upload a story. I'm using voice 
clever stuff. And um, or you can just put in free form your story. You don't have to answer the survey. So we're really trying to encourage this all across um, the community. Finally, I want to again congratulate the Alliance for your many decades of work driving change in the pursuit of women's health equity. I share your commitment to working towards better health and well-being for all women, no matter what stage of life they're in. And I look forward to working with you to fulfil that commitment. And I look forward to being able to access the Women's Health Hub with all the wonderful gems, important information that it will hold and share. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much, Assistant Minister, for those words. And now I'm really excited that we can let the celebration of the Hub begin. <laughs> um, and what better way to do that than by seeing it in practice? Um, and so now I'm going to hand over to incredible Shenna, who is a Senior Project Officer at the Australian Women's Health Alliance, who is going to be taking us on a virtual tour of the Hub. Over to you, Shenna. Thanks so much, Kate. And hi, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to see you online virtually um, to join us for this exciting occasion. Um, so as Kate mentioned, uh, my role as Senior Project Officer has been to drive the national project to refresh this Women's Health Hub. Uh, and really, it builds on this. It builds on a recognition of how valuable it is to have that central point of information um, around women's health to inform research, policy, and practice. Um, this refreshed hub builds on iterations um, that the alliance has worked on over the last few decades, and also um, it reaffirms our focus, in particular, on prevention to support a gender equity approach to health and healthcare across Australia. So with that, uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, and uh, give you a quick tour of the Refreshed Women's Health Hub at australianwomenshealth.org. Also for myself, um, in terms of my visuals, my, I'm a Filipino woman with black hair, big headphones, and my background is blurred. And in terms of the hub, uh, the new Women's Health Hub, uh, it really, uh, it's really my pleasure to share that with you today. So um, the hub itself uh, has five main sections um, that you can navigate through our navigation window. For those new to women's health, or if you're wanting to engage your audiences to make that link between uh, women's health, gender equity and prevention, uh, you can check out those pages under women's health. Um, there's also uh, some information on the 50 years of women's health in Australia as well. The hub resources can be found according to three key pillars. The first is research and evidence uh, and re resources uh, under this category will include national studies, uh, data sets, um, uh, reviews and more. The second section, public policy, uh, will have resources such as national policies, strategies and action plans, as well as policy briefs, papers and position statements. And then uh, the third section uh, is called prevention in practice. And this will include different guides, um, webinar recordings, and in future, we'll be developing some online education and training. The resources themselves can be accessed from a few different places um, around the website. And here uh, is the resources library, which we will be populating over time. Uh, there, are, um, there are ways to search uh, by keywords, search using advanced filters, uh, such as author um, or year published, and also, as I mentioned, filtering according to those three key pillars. Uh, the website itself can also be translated into different languages. Uh, it can also, uh, there are also some accessibility tools such as increasing uh, and decreasing text, uh, changing the, the color and contrast of the website. And there is also a quick exit button if required. 
to get involved, um, if you haven't already, um, you can uh, visit our Get Involved pages. You can join us as a member, uh, donate or collaborate with us on growing the Women's Health Hub. As I mentioned, we'll actually be populating this over time with previous uh, publications and emerging content. And so if you would like to suggest a resource, you can click the suggest a resource link. And we'll also provide links in the chat uh, as well. We also welcome any feedback um, about the website as, as it grows and as we keep building on it over, over the coming years. And I guess uh, what I wanted to leave you with is just to let you know that, you know, this, this first release uh, provides that benchmark. Um, and hopefully, as Bonnie had said, you know, this will become the hub that we make together. So any suggestions for resources, feedback, um, or opportunities to get involved in future co-development sessions, we would love to have you on board. Um, we, we worked with um, graphic designer Jimena Jimenez to design this look and feel, um, including our new logo. And we also engaged Drop-In Solutions, who are a, um, a, a so social enterprise of the WA Council of Social Services. So thank you to the team there, Vikas, Jaime and Fernanda uh, for bringing our vision to life. Uh, and I also wanted to give a shout out to Bonnie Laxton Blinkhorn for your support in copy editing as well. And if you were here um, to join any of our co-development sessions to get this hub to where it is today, thanks so much for your input and we look forward to continuing that conversation. Um, I'll hand over back to uh, to Kate now, um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, continuing that conversation on what it means to bank, share, and utilize knowledge on women's health for gender and health equity. Over to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Shanna. It's so exciting to see it in um, practice. Um, and I know that many of you are gonna be um, really happy to have the opportunity to explore the hub um, more after today's discussion. Um, I guess because the hub is a repository which holds women's voices and stories, it seemed really, really fitting that I would get the opportunity to have um, a discussion with two incredible um, powerhouses today, um, Sasha and Sarah. Um, I'll start um, by introducing Sasha Kuruba Sarago, who is a filmmaker, a speaker, and author of one of my new favorite books, Jiguru, it's time to reclaim beauty, First Nations, wisdom and womanhood. Sasha is also the founder of Ascension, which is Australia's first digital lifestyle magazine for women of colour. Thank you so much for being here today, Sasha. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Sasha, I was wondering if you could do a brief visual description of yourself um, and then I'll kick over to Sarah in a second. Absolutely. I am a First Nations African American woman with mid length curly hair. I have a blurred background and I'm wearing a very lovely lime striped black shirt today. Thanks so much, Sasha. Today we're on the panel. We're also going to be um, joined by Sarah Firth. Sarah is an award winning cartoonist artist, writer, speaker, and graphic recorder. She's currently working on her debut graphic novel, Eventually Everything Connects, which I'm so excited to check out. Thank you so much for being here in this conversation as well today, Sarah. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, and I'll just give a quick visual description of myself. Um, I'm a white Irish Australian uh, woman in her late 30s with um, light brown hair with a fringe and a bun on the top of my head and a red jumper. And my background is um, my lounge room slash studio with lots of art everywhere. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and I guess because today we're all about disrupting hierarchies um, and having a conversation, I'll just tell you a little bit of the context that I'm bringing to the conversation as well. Um, so I'm an artist and I am a co-host of the podcast Being Biracial. And I'm also a family violence lawyer who has worked in the health system. So let's get straight into the conversation. Um, and I guess maybe because I have 
an artistic practice, I'm always really curious about what motivates people. Um, and so Sarah, I was wanting to kick off today's discussion by just asking um, what sparked your interest in graphic recording? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm very excited for us to see what Josephine has been working on because we'll see the beautiful evidence of how powerful and useful graphic recording is. Um, but for me, I actually started off um, doing graphic recording out of absolute necessity um, when I was younger because I didn't realize that I had a learning disability and I had a lot of trouble um, listening and focusing in class um, and reading and writing was a real challenge. Um, and I get into trouble a lot, um, but my mom, bless her, she noticed that if I sat down with a pen, um, what we call dancing the pen, um, I was able to actually listen and focus and absorb what was happening. Um, and over time that developed into kind of early visual notes, which you should, which you could call graphic recording. Um, and it was a way for me to spatially organize the information that I was hearing, add color um, and make a logic that made more sense to someone with my kind of brain um, rather than a very linear way of learning. Um, and I've just kept that up over time for my own learning. And then as I've become an adult, I've realized that that's useful for other people, um, particularly people with different kinds of brains, maybe ADHD or autistic or learning disabilities or low literacy, um, that it's a really useful um, additional tool for communicating um, information and sharing voices and also the like emotional side of um, research and data. I'm wondering, Sasha, if that sparked something for you, I guess, in terms of your experience um, writing your debut novel um, and how that has kind of shaped your understanding of, I guess, particularly First Nations women's wisdom um, in general and how it links to health. Oh, you're on mute, of course. <laughs> I'm muted. <laughs> so when I was writing Jugurthal, it enabled me to connect with my matriarchs. And when we were connecting, I was able to learn, uh, share, but also document our Indigenous cultural knowledge, which for a very long time we weren't able to share you know, due to colonization and past and present government policies, which prevented us from doing so. But as we were gathering as matriarchs and, and women together, we realized that we were engaging in women's business and how women's business is very integral to our optimum health and well-being as First Nations women. And just in that gathering, we opened up a dialogue about how we would like to practice our traditional cultural knowledge and how do we revive it but also protect those practices and the knowledge that we retain. And so when we were speaking in conversation about that, we had to explore different questions. You know, how do we share and protect that traditional cultural knowledge in a way that would enable us to have not only autonomy, but authority and maintain the integrity of those traditional practices and the sacredness. And we had to look at the challenges, the barriers that we were facing. And we also wanted to make sure that we wanted to prevent the commodification and exploitation of those traditional practices, those sacred practices. And so we looked at, for example, birthing on country, which was a practice that we wanted to, to incorporate. And a challenge with that was, us having access as First Nations women to our traditional country or sacred lands. And on the flip side, as we are navigating in a primarily Western institution, do we have open communication partnerships or agreements with you know, Western institutions and practitioners to ultimately have access to you know, our placentas, placentas which we, we bury on sacred land? So we use that as an example of how do we put that in practice? And so for me as a First Nations woman, I have inherently had this understanding, you know, as a child to being a woman, as a, as a person within my community, that when we look at our health and well-being, it's from a holistic point of view. And it's not designated to one person, 
say one institution or one method of looking at our health. Uh, our health is collective. Uh, it's also interconnected and it's heavily interconnected within our culture and the land. So that was some of the, the wisdom and understanding that I was able to obtain when I was doing the process of writing and looking at the different knowledge and wisdom and you know how do we protect and, and how do we keep that flowing for our health and well-being here today. Um, Sarah, I guess like drawing on what um, Sasha is talking about, um, I'm curious because I know that you work with a lot of communities and organizations um, and some in the health ecosystem as well. Like Sasha has kind of drawn on some of the barriers that she has seen and I'm curious about what kind of barriers you've seen in your work doing graphic recording. Yeah, I really, um, uh, the value of what Sasha's talking about can't be overstated. And I think that um, it's something that I see again and again um, in the work that I do across the health ecosystem. And when I say across the health ecosystem, I'm talking about housing, I'm talking about poverty, I'm talking about family violence, I'm talking about um, cultural aspects, I'm talking about marginalization. You know, there's the whole thing is very complex and it's interdependent and there's, it's complex, you know, like, like Shenna was saying that health is a complex thing. Um, and I guess like one of the biggest patterns I see across all of that is that particularly politically, um, unfortunately, a lot of health things get weaponized as if it's a willpower or a, or a moral thing when really most of the um, health issues that come up are a lot to do with systemic barriers and a lot of the solutions are systemic barriers. And it's really important that um, lived experience, um, uh, people who are really dealing with things that their voices are heard and shared and amplified and that that is um, strengthened for people working in a policy and service delivery context. Um, and, you know, I can speak about my experiences as well, being a neurodivergent person trying to access um, and navigate systems. And I have a lot of um, privileges in my life and yet I still find it incredibly difficult to access the resources that I need as um, a neurodivergent person and also a woman. Um, and so I, despite the kind of um, very gnarly problems that we all see and face in the, in the health system, there is so much good work being done. And that's something that I really see a lot is there are so many good people, strong people working um, for collective uh, health outcomes. And that's very exciting actually. Mm. Yeah, I guess like while you've both been speaking, I've just been thinking about the fact that like I'm a woman in my 30s and kind of like I don't you don't get to this point without having like strong opinions about women's health. Um, and so much of that for me, of course, stems back to patriarchy um, and kind of the ways that our health system like operates within that. Um, and that so often like we're seen as I would say like unreliable narrators of our experience. Um, our pain is diminished. Um, blame is placed on our bodies for being inadequate and deficient. Um, and even more so for women of color, obviously. Um, that's what the research shows us. That's what the personal experience shows us. And so it's kind of like a microcosm for me, I guess, of like things that we've always been told more broadly about ourselves as women. Um, and so I guess like linking to what you're saying, Sarah, like I want us to like kind of zoom out for a second and think about like the system, systems more broadly. And I'm really curious about, um, maybe I'll start with you, Sasha, about how like your creative practice, I guess, informs the way you think about systems more broadly. So when I approach my creative systems, because it's quite diverse as an author, filmmaker, uh, editor, and listening to diverse women's points of view, I try to approach my creative practices by asking myself one question. And that question is, am I looking and approaching my work from a Western lens or from a culturally competent standpoint? And so that question has allowed me to work more fluidly and not in a stagnant or static place where there is a multitude of different methods of understanding, but also 
I can approach it with making informed decisions when I'm looking at my work. And so when I think about operating in systems and particularly healthcare, I haven't applied that question in the past. And as a woman in her 40s, I'm more confident and I have more knowledge about how do I take ownership of my healthcare needs. And so in the past, I have realized that I've been operating through that lens of a Western lens. So giving my power and authority over to who I deem the experts, which is health practitioners and institutions, which to a level they are, but ultimately the power and authority lies within me. I know best about my body. And so I have experience as a black woman navigating the health system, unfortunately, medical biases, you know, racism and discrimination, which actually contributed to me not feeling confident in asking questions to looking for a second, third, fourth opinion until I got the answers that I needed or adequate health care because I didn't believe that I knew best. Now, being more knowledgeable and confident as I stand today, I'm looking at the healthcare and the systems that I operate in, in a more culturally competent way. And so that gives me the power and authority in my hands and allows me to operate with body sovereignty that I'm always going to be the expert and what do I need to do, say, or who do I need to employ to help me get my needs met? So that question has been so powerful for me in how do I get my needs met? How do I get my voice heard um, in any system that I'm operating in? What about you, Sarah? How does your creative practice kind of inform the way you think about systems? Um, I just wanted to say, I love what you said just then, Sasha, about body sovereignty, because um, sort of looking more at my collective group of um, friends who, you know, females in their late, late uh, 30s, there are so many um, health challenges that many of us are having uh, typically around reproductive health. And it's shocking how much is still not known and how access is still so poor. Um, and I just, so many people put up with pain for far too long because they think it's normal. And a lot, there's a lot of shame of people not talking about what they're going through in this type of thing. Um, and I guess, to tie that into the question you asked, um, Kate, about how does my creative practice um, tie in with that? Um, I'm very interested because I have a lot of trouble understanding things because of my learning disability. It makes me very interested in trying to map out systems or figure out how things work. And in doing so, I see a lot of kind of incongruities. And to Sasha's point, um, there are so many different ways of knowing systems, actions, um, how to arrange together. And I really feel like um, there is more interest now in exploring different and culturally appropriate ways to think about what different people need. And in my work, I'm very interested in how do we hold the complexity of experience, the complexity of systems that do and don't work, and where can I or we as, you know, small nodes in broader ecosystems of people and a health system, um, you know, stand up for our body sovereignty, um, support the, the people that we love to stand up for their body sovereignty, and then collectively, how can we help impact systems? And I'm very interested in that, you know, macro and micro in my work. And I feel like with graphic recording as a practice, it's very good at being able to hold the, the micro, the lived experience, and the macro of the bigger system and sort of get us thinking in multiple levels and um, I find at least for me just even in understanding systems it's really useful to kind of you know map out the different thresholds of how things interact um, I hope that makes sense yeah. mm, no it really makes sense do you have a sense of um, like how your graphic recordings are used by organizations like kind of beyond um, beyond the like the context of the event in which they're created like to do that kind of macro micro work do you have a sense yeah of that? so um what I'm going to say is a little bit of an oversimplification but it might kind of help create a mental model of it which is 
in a live event like this, a graphic recording usually gets made with everyone watching. So it's collaborative. So we as attendees kind of create a, a mnemonic, like a memory, a memory map of what was said and that sort of sticks in our mind so we can use it to jog our memory of what was said but then also we can take that as an asset after an event to show our mom our sister our kids um, and share that information along in a in a micro individual uh, community context but then also a graphic recording can be used in a policy document in a report to add an extra it doesn't re it doesn't replace all of the rigorous detailed information, but it's an addition that can help people who might not engage with a report so well um, to enter into what was said, how things feel. Um, the less explicit information, more the tacit feeling of things. Um, and so it can be really um, compelling in a policy space for helping people see, you know, this is what people said, this is how they feel. So it can be you it can be used in lots of different ways and um, graphic recordings are typically very attractive to look at. They've got interesting pieces and colors and things like that. Um, so in my experience, that's typically how they get used. Um, Sasha, I, we haven't really touched on it yet, but I'm kind of curious about like you, you founded Ascension um, and I'm curious about, um, I guess, your process in in deciding to kind of go out a limb go out on a limb um, and create that space and kind of what the impetus was for that um because i imagine it kind of links to what you were talking about earlier in terms of approaching your the way that you approach your work more generally absolutely i was trying to find a representation of my voice uh, and also visually through mainstream women's magazines. And I realized that the way that I showed up in the world was quite different from what was on the shelves or being represented digitally. And after so many years of complaining and writing letters to the editors, <laughs> uh, I needed to be the change that I wanted to see. So that gave me the inspiration to start a digital platform. And I decided 12, 13 years ago, so say 2011, that I wanted the space to be digital because I knew that my diverse background was touching upon different motherlands and I wanted to have a broad reach so women of colour, not only in Australia, could also have these conversations uh, internationally as well as we do come from far and wide. And it was really important to make up for lost ground when it comes to those conversations that we haven't had in this country and get the support internationally where we could draw upon different best practices or different uh, issues that have been making, you know, groundbreaking work to learn from and incorporate that here in Australia. So it was really not having a representation to, to fall upon and to actually authenticate, you know, my lived experience. And so that's why I started Ascension to, to be celebrated, to, to learn from each other ultimately. Um, and it's been wonderful because we've had you know, non-women of colour coming onto the platform and learning and seeing the commonalities. And that's what it's all about, um, being able to share these experiences and, and grow and, and progress. And I'm imagining that the space has changed quite a lot um, more recently. Like, have you seen that? Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, for me, it was realising that the digital landscape has also um, grown this multitude of subgroups that multiply um, quite exponentially. And so when I first started the platform, it was something that hadn't been done before. It was primarily in a print type of landscape. And so now um, it's allowed us to be diverse and innovative in how we share that information, you know, which you know, Sarah touches on. Um, it really caters to different groups um, so that's just been such a blessing where, you know, we're continually learning and evolving in the way that we communicate and we represent ourselves. I guess kind of on that note, I'm curious about, um, maybe I'll start with you, Sarah, I guess more broadly about thinking about how we make knowledge about women's health more accessible and so it can inform policy. Um, and then I'll go to you, Sasha. 
Um, look, well, I have my I have my bias towards visual visuals, which is you know, visuals are inaccessible to many people, but um, for people who yeah have um, neurodivergence, it's often um, spatial information is more um, easy to navigate, and I think that particularly with women's health, it's really important to um, yeah elevate the voices of. Um, people experiencing it and um, for me just being able to listen to people in a room and draw that live on a screen that everyone can see um, there's something really powerful in that like you are being heard it is right there but also it's depersonalized so when we're talking about difficult really difficult topics particularly family violence um, there can be real barriers to sharing what's going on and what's not working and it's a really good way to protect people's um, safety uh, but also get their voices there and have the emotional content that comes with it um, that, that's very important as well rather than just the statistics around it. What about you Sasha what do you think? Sorry can I get the question again I was so engrossed in what Sarah was saying. Oh no and and feel free to um <laughs> I guess speak to some of what Sarah is speaking to as well. Um, I guess the the broader question is like how it's very broad, but how do we make knowledge about women's health like more accessible? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm learning so much from Sarah, um, and and that's what's just so wonderful about this forum. And so when I think about uh, how we can make ourselves accessible, I think you know if we flip that question and edit it, how do we make ourselves accessible to the broad and diverse wealth of knowledge that's out there when it comes to women's health you know are we coming out of our own environments and stepping into the woman's environment in an environment where she is safe to be seen and heard but also too, I, I was thinking about this lately about my own health aspirations of you know, capturing and reviving and incorporating indigenous knowledge and health practices. Now, when we look at the statistics, I don't know exactly what they are, but I would like to say that I'm com comfortable that it's about 50% that we're from diverse backgrounds when we talk about you know, our community of women. And I often wonder about the different indigenous knowledges, ancient, practices and, and health practices that have been held by diverse women in their cultures, which they would like to practice here and today. And you know, how are we having conversations around that on nurturing and encouraging that access to that? Do we have the tools, the resources to champion that? And, and stepping out of a primarily sort of Western framework of looking at health and operating in that system. Um, so that's what I think about when it comes to accessibility of how do we make ourselves more, more fluid and flexible into the changes of those health practices that we know today or were quite comfortable. You know, are we able to be uncomfortable in this space? to become more powerful in the way that we represent the women that we want to make sure that their health and well-being is the best that it can be. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I feel like when you were speaking earlier about body sovereignty, I was thinking a lot about the fact that um, we do have to kind of like play this game um of being like kind of the perfect balance of like stern enough that we'll be taken serious but like docile enough that it seems like we're happy to be here grateful for the knowledge <laughs> all of that kind of thing and that's such a like difficult balancing act that I think um so many of us and so many women of color have to do in their day-to-day -day lives um anyway um a lot of reading the room so much reading the room and like when you're navigating a healthcare system that's the one moment where you don't want to have to read the room um and I and I guess like yes yeah, Sarah I have a question for both of you which is if you could 
if you could like, oh, I don't want to say wave a magic wand, but it's like if you could make health settings more um, culturally safe, what are the, like just for the people here today, like are there any key things that you would be, that you're like, I would love to see this or I would love to see this as opposed to you having to read the room and conform to that? Like what would you love to see in the room already to make it more comfortable for you? I mean, leadership leadership that's the only thing that I can think of at the moment is is leadership that we have you know first nations women or women of color at the head of these conversations and driving the policy and the way that we we look at our health and all those different perspectives in in the room that ideally uh in a, in a magical world I would love to see that because I know that I, I, I speak from my experience that I feel more comfortable. You know, that's why I love, you know, going to the Indigenous health services because it feels like I am protected, that's my space, and I don't have to second guess that space at all. And so if I could see women who reflect the community and my culture that are driving these changes, that would make my life so much better that I don't have to translate and trying to use allies to get my point across, which really negates um, the, a lot of the authenticity at times when if it could just be spoken from A to B and be trusted and heard, that would really enable me to, to get the best outcome, not only for myself, but you know, for my community and future generations that we don't have to keep reinventing the will and, and coming to this, this crossroads continually. So leadership is um, imperative for that. Yeah, and I guess for me, um, similar to Sasha, uh, I guess when I was working, like kind of as an outsider, as a family violence lawyer, but working like kind of in that space, you know, in a hospital setting, um, yeah, I was overwhelmed by how white those spaces are, especially in the upper end of leadership. Um, and I and my mum also um, is. Yeah, she's Iranian and she's a doctor and um, and I know just from having kind of heard about her experiences how it how difficult it is for her to um, I guess be in the medical space um, and how much racism there is um, and so it's so difficult because I kind of from my perspective I'm like these hospitals are so white and then also I'm like but it is so difficult um, for people like my mum um, to kind of exist in those spaces. Um, and so, yeah, I, I completely agree with Sasha. Leadership is everything. And I think uh, a while ago I read um, Tracy McMillan Cottom um, is an incredible um, Black author from the US and she wrote this incredible essay um, about, and actually Sarah, I think you did a graphic recording of one of her events um, at Broadside, but she did this incredible um, essay that kind of talked about also the way that um, black women's pain is kind of diminished and kind of drew on her own experience, but also Serena Williams' experience. And I was like, if Serena Williams can't be believed, like what chance do the rest of us have? Um, so yeah, those are the kind of the things that I often think about. And um, so we're coming, we're running out a bit of a bit of time, of course, because I've been so caught up in how good this conversation is. So I just, in closing today, I really um, just wanted to draw on something from your book, Sasha. Um, and in it, you finish with a love letter um, to a younger version of yourself. And I just thought it would be really fitting for us to finish in a, in a similar way. And so I'm curious, and maybe I'll start with you, Sasha, and then go to Sarah about what you both wish you could teach yourself and tell your younger self um, about women's health. I would tell my younger self that I ultimately have the power and I am the expert over my health and my body. I would say to my younger self to listen and strengthen my intuition because my intuition is a personal compass. It's specifically designed for me and it will always lead me in the right direction. Also to ask as many questions as I need, that I have the right to say no and change my mind when it comes to my health and body. And lastly, I would say to my younger self to 
research and build a team of health practitioners, institutions or allies that are invested in my health just as much as I am. That's what I would say to my younger self. I wish I could say all those things to my younger self too. <laughs> what about you, Sarah? Um, I think for me, uh, because I spent a lot of time thinking that I was somehow broken or stupid, um, cause that's what I was told, um, that no, you are not. And that, um, you have a different brain and that is a good thing. Um, and that when you're older, there will be a groundswell of people on social media who are talking about what it's like to have a different brain and you will finally find your community. So hang in there. That's what I would, um, tell myself. Um, and also, um, yeah, I would say that like having pain, you know, keep pushing to have people take your pain seriously and that it, it's not normal to be in huge amounts of pain. Um, and that if someone doesn't take you seriously, go to someone else and keep pushing for that. Um, and yeah, body sovereignty, love it. Yeah. Um, what I'm really hearing from both of you is, I guess, like find your team and find your community and believe yourself, um, which is like, I think the perfect way to end today's conversation. Um, so thank you both for your generosity in speaking not only about your professional experience, but also your personal experience. Um, I just really, really appreciate you both for being here. So thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. Um, and now that we've had this discussion that includes discussion about graphic recording, I can't think of a better time um, for us to throw to the incredible work that Josephine Ford from Digital Story Storytellers has been tirelessly working on. I can see it on my screen um, and I'm, oh, I'm so excited um, for you all um, to see it. It's so cool to have an artistic summary of the event, but also so important, I guess, um, also hearing from what uh, Sarah has talked about um, today. I um, really want to, I guess, finish up today's session by just thanking a few people. Um, I really want to thank um, the Honourable Jed Carney MP um, for joining us and officially launching the Hub. Um, I also want to acknowledge the incredible work of our Ozan interpreters, Jerry and Fiona. Thank you so much um, for all that you do. I also want to thank um, the Australian Women's Health Alliance, not only for being a national voice on women's health, um, but also putting on today's event. And I particularly want to shout out um, Bonnie and Shanna um, for their incredible work um, and also Suhaila who has been behind the scenes making sure all of the tech issues work out um, and that we haven't had any glitches and I guess um, most importantly uh, I would encourage you all to go and check out the Women's Health Hub that's why we're here and um, you will have seen um, the link to it in the chat um, but otherwise uh, it is at Australian Women's Health Org. The hub is the place where you'll be able to access today's Zoom recording, see Josephine's incredible artwork. Thank you so much, Josephine. Um, and you'll also be able to find more information, as Shanna mentioned, about getting involved, joining as a member, donating, um, finding out how you can collaborate with the Alliance. Um, it's all there on the hub. Um, and today, uh, I guess when we finish and we end the Zoom, you're going to get a little survey um, that will pop up. Uh, your feedback is so important to us. And I guess just to help the Women's Health Alliance uh, more broadly to strengthen their work um, and will be used for reporting and continuous um, improvement purposes. So please fill it in. Uh, your voice is really important as you've heard. Um, and so we'd love to hear it. And that's it. Um, we're finished. So I'll close today by encouraging you all again to go and check out the Women's Health Hub. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of um, today's launch. I've had such a great time. Thank you.